You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcasts. I have uh, Dr. Richard Wasserman. He's a board certified, he's, he is board certified by the American Board of Allergy and Immunology at the American Board of Pediatrics. He has a medical degree from Mount Sinai School of Medicine, uh, University of Texas Southwestern Medical School, completed a pediatrics residency at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and a fellowship uh, training in bone marrow transplantation and immunology at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Did some postdoctoral cancer and immunology work at University of Texas, um, and on and on and on. Many many credentials. So, uh, Dr. Wasserman, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Um, terrific, and happy to be here. Thank you, Richard. Or, yeah, tell thank, me, uh, th- thank you, Dr. Jacobs. <laughs> well, I'm not a doctor, but uh, yeah, I'm ah, just an interviewer. Okay. Yeah. okay well, tell, uh, no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, your work now. What What's your focus? Well, the major focus of my work for the past 10 plus years has been the treatment of food allergy by a process called oral immunotherapy, or OIT. Very similar in concept to allergy shots, which have been done for over 120 years. And the strategy is to identify people who are truly allergic to a food and then uh, retrain their allergy system by introducing minute quantities and gradually increasing amounts of the problem food until they're able to eat a full meal-sized portion. So what is an allergic response? Like what happens in the body when the the Uh, it's perceived that way? Sure. So the major, the kind of food allergy that people normally think of is called an immediate allergic reaction. In immediate allergic reactions, uh, a problem occurs usually within uh, 15 to 60 minutes of eating the food, sometimes even faster, and it consists of one or more of the following kinds of signs or symptoms. Hives, uh, swelling of the eyes, mouth, lips, or tongue, coughing, sneezing, wheezing, Uh, change in the sound of the voice, sudden vomiting, or in a child, sudden quietness. When it occurs in an adult, uh, people describe a sense of impending doom. So that is an immediate allergic reaction, and uh, that's what most people think of when they're talking about food allergy. Oh, man, that's terrible. What what is the mechanism by which uh, allergy can happen? Well, the immune system... Uh, comprises several different parts, and the allergy system is uh, governed by the presence of allergic antibody. Antibodies are blood proteins that are made uh, when the body encounters something foreign, and uh, the it's called IgE uh, or immunoglobulin E. And people who are allergic to something, whether it be cats or um, mountain cedar or uh, peanuts uh, have made uh, this allergic antibody and the allergic antibody coats allergy cells 
and the allergy cells live primarily at the interface between a person and the outside world. So the nose, the respiratory tract, uh, the skin, and the GI tract. And if a person encounters uh, one of these foreign substances like uh, peanut or cat dander or, uh, or mountain cedar pollen, uh, those foreign substances will bind to the allergic antibody coating the allergy cell and literally cause the allergy cell to explode, releasing histamine and dozens of other chemicals that cause the symptoms that make you feel bad. So it's uh, they bind to the to our own allergy cells, or they bind to the allergen cells. No, the a- allergen is the foreign substance. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and that foreign substance binds to the allergic antibody, and the allergic antibody is prebound. So uh, when a person is allergic, uh, they are walking around with uh, millions of allergy cells that are coated with specific allergic antibody. And when they encounter the substance that the allergic antibody binds to, it's bound and it causes activation of allergy cells and release of chemicals that cause symptoms. I see. So um, a low-level allergic response is probably healthy, but a massive one, I guess, would cause massive fragments of uh, allergens and cause a big inflammatory response, right? Well, there's a, there's a lot of controversy uh, or differing explanations uh, over the past uh, 100 years about why we have allergy at all, how did it evolve. And so one of the suggestions is that uh, cat allergy offered a benefit to people um, in the jungle because they would sense the presence of a lion or a tiger before the predator would get to them. Uh, and, and that's one hypothesis of why we have allergy. Why that has turned out to cause so much trouble for so many people to other things that are more benign, nobody really understands. Um, the allergic response is an important part of fighting certain kinds of um, germs or um, parasites. So uh, people um, who are encounter a parasite, which is a particular kind of infection, uh, the allergic antibody reacts to the parasite and helps control that kind of an infection. But when there's allergy, uh, like in uh, in central Texas, in Austin and San Antonio, where mountain cedar is very active, that really makes people miserable for more than a month, and nobody really understands why that, uh, why that occurs, why, how people got to be allergic to those substances. So, okay, so your thinking is to introduce a very, very small amount of these allergens, right. and what will that do? It'll create a, a just a well, low-level inflammatory response? No, um, let me kind of walk you through an example of, of what happens. So um, we begin our treatment with about one ten thousandth of a peanut and gradually increase over a period of months from one ten thousandth of a peanut every day to 12 peanuts every day. And for those patients who like peanut and want to eat peanut, uh, they uh, are then exposed to 24 peanuts, which is a peanut butter sandwich. And if they do okay with that peanut butter sandwich, then they can add peanut to their diet. And in order to maintain that benefit, they need to have a certain amount of peanut every day. Um, the process that I just described to you of increasing doses uh, is called desensitization. And uh, in order to maintain that state of desensitization, you have to take a maintenance dose of the peanut every day. If you want a mechanistic explanation, um, go back to my description of the allergy cells coated with allergic antibody. And if 
the uh, if two allergic antibodies directed at the same thing, so two anti-peanut antibodies, for example, get cross-linked or attached to each other by a small amount of peanut protein, that's what triggers the cell. Uh, if only one of those uh, peanut antibodies is attached to some peanut protein, then nothing happens. And what we think we're doing with this desensitization process is to introduce such a low level of, uh, of peanut protein that these receptors or antibodies are occupied one at a time and they don't cross-link and trigger a reaction. At the you, same um, time, oh, go ahead, please. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, at the same time, there are different kinds of white blood cells called regulatory cells, and we're doing the same thing to those. But when those, uh, when the receptors on regulatory cells get occupied by peanut protein, they regulate the allergy response downward. So at the same time that we're occupying receptors, slowly occupying receptors on allergy cells, uh, we're also occupying the receptors on regulatory cells, and that um, diminishes the allergic response over time. Do you um, have patients that still are so allergic that even at minute doses, they'll, uh, they'll have a massive response? Well, there's always that risk of having an allergic response, but um, in our treatment of over 800 patients, um, less than 1% have reacted on the first dose of treatment. And we try to design the treatment in such a way as to minimize uh, reactions by going slowly enough so that we don't trigger the allergic response. That's great. Yeah. Huh. So the focus is peanut allergies, and uh, or are you are you moving on to other allergies as well? Well, we've treated about twenty different foods, including milk, egg, wheat, cashew nut, uh, walnut, chickpea, sesame seed, sunflower seeds. So uh, once we kind of got the hang of what we were doing, we were able to generalize the approach, uh, building off what we learned from the first several foods that we did. Um, people are most concerned about peanut allergy, and so about half of the patients that we've treated have had allergy to peanut, but the other half have had allergy to the other variety of foods I just mentioned. Huh. Interesting. Um, are there other doctors and clinics that are doing this, or is this unique to you? Well, when I started uh, about 11 years ago, I actually was inspired to begin this work by a colleague in, in El Paso, Texas, uh, Dr. Lyndon Mansfield. And we were at a scientific meeting having breakfast, and he mentioned that he had treated a couple of people in the way I just described and had had good results. And I was very excited by that. He generously shared his procedure with me, and I spent about two years uh, working up the plan and doing research on how best to do this. And, uh, and that's kind of uh, how I got started. We began with milk and egg and then uh, graduated uh, to peanut. But how would this... Um, oh, and I'm think... sorry. And then, so when... Um, so we began with milk and egg and then graduated to peanut uh, based on what Dr. Mansfield had shared with me. At that time, there were only two or three uh, allergy clinics around the United States that were doing OIT or oral immunotherapy as a treatment. At this time, there are probably about 200 uh, allergy practices in the United States that are offering this treatment. And um, how do you think the mechanism works when you treat people? I mean, you described it at the beginning when you give them minute amounts, but as you increase the amount to substantial amounts, is it the same mechanism by which they're protected? Or like, how would that happen yes. that they now have yes. resistance? So imagine you had, 
I, don't, I can't think of a good metaphor for you other than um, what I just said. So if, if there are 2,000 receptors on the surface of a mast cell, an allergy cell, 2,000 peanut receptors, um, if we are gradually filling them almost one at a time, uh, the peanut protein doesn't cross-link two of those receptors. And as we gradually increase the dose, we're gradually increasing the number of receptors that are occupied. But again, since it's a slow addition, uh, it's uh, almost one-to-one between a fragment of peanut protein and the receptor, and there's no cross-linking. And if there's no cross-linking, there's no reaction. I see what you mean. Okay. That's why they chronically have to take in a little bit of the allergen every day, the peanut or right. whatever once, it is. Once, so once you've saturated all the receptors, um, what protects you is keeping those receptors saturated. So that's why you have to take a maintenance dose every day. Well, has science looked at people that are not allergic to, you know, peanuts and what are their bodies doing that's different? What, um, there's really no good uh, answer to explain why some people get allergic to some things. Uh, At this point, we know a lot more than we knew even 10 years ago, but to a large extent, it's still like the blind man and the elephant. Um, We know of certain genes and families of genes that predispose people to having allergic responses. We know how to induce an allergic response in an experimental animal under controlled conditions, a mouse or a hamster or a guinea pig. Uh, and, and we have some understanding of why some people um, develop allergy to foods. But in general, there's not a good explanation for why um, a person might be allergic to a cat or or mountain cedar. When it comes to food allergy, um, what we've learned uh, just over the past 10 to 15 years is that when a person is exposed to a food through the skin, where there's contact with the food, that is much more likely to cause an allergic reaction than if you swallow the food. And uh, even more so, if the food encounters damaged skin, uh, that's a much bigger risk factor for the development of food allergy. So what we think is going on with, with most infants and toddlers who develop food allergy is that they uh, have encountered the food, say a, a parent was making a peanut butter sandwich and didn't wash their hands before picking up the baby, and there's some... Uh, some peanut butter on the hands that they're unaware of that gets applied to the skin and that's how the allergic reaction develops and um, infants and toddlers who have eczema are at dramatically increased risk for developing food allergy because that damaged skin is even more likely to react when there's contact so uh, that's the current best explanation for much of food allergy. Interesting. So uh, clinically, when do people come to you? Like, what are they on their last straw? Uh, You know, have they had like near-death experience with a particular allergen or is it early on? What what do you see? Well, so um, one can really think of two completely different problems relating to having a food allergy. One is the risk of a severe allergic reaction, which is potentially fatal, and that's certainly a preoccupation for many families, and and they're really anxious to do whatever they can to minimize that risk. But the other uh, factor, which I think is in a way equally important, is that uh, children with food allergy uh, have a very big burden in life. Uh, their their lives and the lives of their family members are often distorted. Um, 40% of children in um, primary school uh, have been bullied uh, about their food allergy. 
well-meaning attempts to manage the problem have terribly negative consequences. So uh, elementary schools that have a peanut table in the cafeteria where children with peanut allergy are forced to sit isolated from their friends uh, creates a terrible social situation. Um, Many of these children never go to summer camp. They never go to birthday parties or a sleepover uh, because their friends' parents are unwilling to take responsibility for the potential of a reaction. So they lead you know, very uh, limited lives. Uh, many families who have a food allergic child never go to restaurants or never travel away from home. Uh, and there was a recent study that showed that the mothers of children with food allergy have significantly higher blood pressure than the mothers of children who don't have food allergy. So there are all kinds of consequences psychological and social consequences to the food allergy that in a way are more immediate than the theoretical risk. The risk of dying of food allergy in the United States is roughly similar to the risk of dying from a lightning strike. I see what you mean. So um, when parents and people come to you, um, you know, are they very hesitant to even try your method, or is it uh, a pretty simple thing to get them doing? Like, you know, and- well, most of the most of the people who come to me for food allergy are aware of oral immunotherapy. There are great social media networks on Facebook, primarily, but also Instagram and Twitter, uh, and a, a very active communication network about food allergy and food allergy treatments. So most parents come to me uh, because they want the treatment. Uh, some, many of them are concerned about the risks and are hesitant and, um, and we never encourage people uh, and, and promote the therapy to them. This is something we make available to people who want it and we you know, tell them all about it and the risks and potential benefits. Okay, so all right, so they're already aware of, of the therapy. They come to you. Um, is it pretty much a, a seamless process to get them along the continuum towards uh, not being allergic, or is it like are there well, stumbling blocks? Uh, so uh, we have a very carefully worked out routine for how to uh, perform this therapy that is quite standardized. I think that it's important for safety reasons to make sure that everybody involved knows exactly what's going on and and has the right uh, plans and expectations. But because this is a treatment and not a research study, we have the ability to customize it to the needs of each individual patient. And while the overwhelming majority of the patients follow the standard scheme, um, there are bumps in the road for some people, and they may have um, side effects relating to the GI tract, or they may have reactions despite our best efforts, and so we have to make adjustments for that. Uh, but about 80% of people who start reach their target dose and uh, start their maintenance. Well, that's cool. Like, I'm allergic to cats. So, I mean, would you, you know, do you have like a 10,000th of a cat hair that I could get at your clinic every day and, you know, like, I don't know, inhale some well, cat dander every day to help? There is, a, there is a way of doing that, but for things that you breathe in like cat, it's much more effective to do shots. Oh, okay. So, so if the cats bother you, that's a solvable problem. Uh, and I could give you the names of several good allergists in Austin who would be delighted to help you. Well, for for listeners, how do allergy shots work? What's the mechanism there and how many do you need? And for myself too. Uh, So um, allergy shots work in a way that's very similar to what I just described, uh, except that it's injected. And again, you start with a very minute amount of material and gradually increase the amount of the allergic substance like cat, dog, mountain cedar, Bermuda grass, 
uh, pollens and uh, up to uh, a substantial dose. And uh, the typical way uh, to do allergy shots is uh, there are two parts to the therapy, a buildup part and a maintenance part. And depending upon how your allergist selects to do it, uh, the buildup can take as little as three weeks or as long as 24, 26 weeks. And then maintenance on the average is three to four years. And there's good scientific data that says that the majority of people who do a program like that uh, have an enduring remission that lasts decades. And for most people who do allergy shots, they do it once in a lifetime. I wonder if um, if it would be smart to take like a, you know a pretty expansive food allergy test, like the Alcat or something, and then uh, get yourself on a series of shots to uh, to reduce your food allergies. Not so that you can necessarily eat those foods, but right. so that you wouldn't so, be negatively affected by them. Would that be a strategy? That is the the prototype of the very worst approach to food allergy that is imaginable. (laughs) And there are national and international guidelines that um, vigorously recommend against testing to panels of foods. You should never test for an allergy to a food without a history of the food having caused an immediate type reaction. So the diagnosis of food allergy is made primarily by history and food allergy testing, whether by blood test or skin test, are confirmatory rather than diagnostic. And the reason for that is that there is a very important difference between what is called sensitization and what is called allergy. Sensitization means that you have made allergic antibody but many people have allergic antibody and have no allergy to the food in question. And so uh, the rate of false positive reactions when you do the kind of screening test that you just described is very high and people end up on distorted diets for no reason at all. Uh, And that's um, vigorously discouraged. So, You know, food allergy is really very much like pregnancy. You either have it or you don't. If you have food allergy, you will have the symptoms I described, hives, swelling of the mouth, eyes, lips or tongue, coughing, wheezing, sneezing, vomiting, uh, within a few minutes of eating the food, and it will happen every time you eat the food. It doesn't come and go. And if you have that kind of constellation of problems, then testing is valuable to confirm which food is the causative agent and to help you manage that problem. And if you don't have that constellation of problems, you may have a food-related problem that is not food allergy. So there are a large number of food intolerances where food allergy testing is of no value. And the simplest uh, of food intolerances would be something like insomnia from caffeine or runny nose from a a jalapeno pepper dish uh, or gas from beans. Those are all food intolerances. uh, And there are many other food intolerances, but food allergy testing is of no value there and can often be misleading. And and I often see children who are failing to thrive and are small and thin because they have been um, subject to unnecessarily restrictive diets based on inappropriate food allergy testing. So that's a real problem. Yeah, it's weird. Where is that dividing line between it being a good idea to expose you to many different things so you, you know, have a resilience and certain things, uh, you know, not exposing yourself to them because they cause you some kind of problem. Well, that depends on what kind of things you're talking about and what the age of the person is. So, um, you know, 
human beings have evolved over hundreds of thousands of years uh, in in ways that were largely uncontrolled or uh, unregulated, and that's what brought us to where we are today. So having that kind of diverse exposure uh, to food and the natural environment, I think, is uh, very important for good health. So, uh, so on the other hand, um, you know, if, um, if you know you have a problem with something, so if, you, if you're a blank slate and have no problems and you're starting out in life, you should be exposed to the diversity of the world around you. But if you're five years old or older uh, and you've established that you're allergic to something, uh, then you are best avoiding that something so that you don't suffer the consequences of it. So having a little bit of allergy, uh, once the allergy is established, having a little bit of exposure to things is not a great idea. Um, that's the way to foster the development of asthma in somebody who's allergic. Uh, so uh, if you're allergic to the dog or the cat, uh, you'd be best off avoiding the dog or the cat uh, unless you were to do something like allergy shots, which would retrain your body's allergy system so that you would be less allergic to that. Yeah, if, if there's a certain food that causes you allergies or something, you know, should you, I mean, if you cut out that food, would you get even more sensitive to that food over time if you encounter it again? Or is it better to deliberately have very small amounts of that food to acclimatize yourself to that food so that you don't have any reactions from that on? Because you would think maybe that would cause a low level inflammation response that's ongoing, which may not be good for your health. It's just hard to know, like, do you engage or do you withdraw from a given thing that gives you allergies? Well, um, there's, there's no uncertainty about that. If a food causes an allergic reaction, you should avoid it. Uh, unless you're in a carefully determined and regulated plan to treat that food allergy. So the standard of care in North America for people who are allergic to a food is to avoid that food uh, because uh, because the severity of a reaction is not predicted by the severity of a previous reaction. So that's one of the myths about food allergies is that, well, I had this kind of a reaction and that's what will happen to me the next time I eat it. And that's not necessarily true. Uh, so you could have had only mild reactions and then encounter the food uh, at another time and have a very severe life-threatening reaction. That's one of oh, the biggest myths about cool. food allergy. Well, it's good to know. I have a, a friend whose daughter is allergic to pork and pineapple, I guess is some kind of protein, and it makes his daughter's mouth itch, but it's no worse than that. So you're saying that doesn't mean that the next time that she has one of those things, it couldn't be very severe and significant. So there is a particular kind of um, of disorder that is in the family of food allergies called oral allergy syndrome. And uh, we don't have time during this hour for me to explain the details of oral allergy syndrome other than to say that it is uh, a situation uh, that occurs most commonly with fruits and vegetables and causes mouth itch and nothing else. And in those patients, food allergy testing is negative, uh, and they are not at risk for more severe allergic reactions. But that's oral allergy syndrome. Uh, that's not true food allergy. Okay. But it's a, good, uh, it's a good precautionary note, it sounds like, that, again, if a food gives you an allergic reaction, according to the classic symptoms you described, don't assume that it's always going to be the same reaction. It's probably better to exactly. stay away from it unless you do an intervention. Okay, got it. Right. Huh. Okay. Much more complicated than I thought, but it always is. You know? So, <laughs> well, very good. So what's the best way for people to uh, get in touch with, you know, you and your clinic or find out about your work, your research? How, how can they take it further from here after listening? Well, um, they 
can contact us at the Dallas Food Allergy Center, uh, either uh, by Googling Dallas Food Allergy Center or or me, or they could call uh, 972-566-7788 and request information or an appointment. Okay, very good. And then are there any good uh, general resources to look at for people to learn more about allergies and interventions? Yes, their um, foodallergy.org is the Food Allergy and Research, Educa- Research and Education Organization, and they're the leading patient advocacy group for people with food allergies, and their website is loaded with reliable, scientifically-based uh, information relating to food allergy and advice and tips on how to cope with food allergy in schools and going off to college and with traveling. So that's the most reliable source of information. Well, very good. Well, Dr. Wasserman, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Okay. I want to keep you on for just a couple more minutes because I got a list of questions and I would like to take a minute to just walk through them and you can um, cut and paste or ignore them completely. Probably about five minutes worth. Is that okay? Oh, sure. You want me to include them in the podcast? Yeah, I think they okay. they relate, and you just see where they fit. Sure, okay? go ahead. Yep. Okay, so uh, you know, my goal for doing this treatment uh, is to normalize the lives of children and their families so they don't have to live uh, with fear of food and the distortion that I, I described before. Uh, My vision for this work is that um, food allergy will no longer interfere with the lives of those people, and it's my mission to try and make everyone aware of the opportunity to treat their food allergies. Um, In a different vein, I talked just about one myth uh, about food allergy, that uh, the severity of a reaction does not predict the severity of the next reaction. Uh, Another common myth is that if a food allergy reaction is starting, you should give antihistamine uh, to treat that reaction, and that is wrong. The antihistamine never saved anybody's life with a food allergy reaction, and the treatment is epinephrine with an auto-injector. Uh, and there are several commercial varieties of them, like EpiPen or AviQ. Uh, and people who have food allergies should have that available uh, at all times. Uh, the other um, comment that I wanted to make is that uh, there's a lot of hype about the risk of uh, fatal food allergy in airplanes that serve peanuts or other nuts. And uh, so it's important to understand that food does not fly. Uh, That is, uh, if somebody a row away from you is eating peanuts, it's not, the peanuts are not going to fly into your mouth. Uh, In order to have a severe reaction to a food, you really have to eat it. So there, there is, um, there are internet based facts, which turn out to be not true, uh, one of which is that there are people who can have severe life-threatening allergy from uh, being around a food and smelling it or inhaling it, and that has actually been disproved. So uh, relating to food allergy and airplanes, uh, the best advice is to look around uh, at the seat and wipe down the tray table, and uh, and that's really all that's necessary uh, to protect an infant or toddler or a young child from uh, having a reaction to peanuts on an airplane. And those are my list of responses to the questions. So I'm done okay. unless you have anything else. No, no, that's great. Those are important to include, so I'll include them. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, 
where we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.